This week, uh, you're going to learn a new way to uh, sample from posterior distributions that will let us go into the more complex model forms in the second half of the course. And if I can fulfill my ambition, we'll start maximum entropy uh, into this week too, which will be a mainly conceptual introduction, uh, which will be the foundation for the generalized linear models next week. So at the start of the course, I already pitched um, this historical retrospective view that Contemporary scientific inference is bizarre in the long run sense in that we bet on chance. We study randomness as a way to learn about the deterministic nature of the world. And this seems unremarkable to us because we live in that age where we study stochastic processes and we, we have all of this, these formal apparatuses for doing so. But um, you don't have to go very far back in Western intellectual history uh, for this to look like sheer madness. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the Romans and the Greeks both had this uh, goddess that was the personification of chance and um, Fortuna. Uh, and uh, there are various philosophers, I quote two here, uh, trashing Fortuna just endlessly through history that you, you don't, don't take chances. Um, uh, uh, you know, this is the Western rationalist tradition. Uh, and St. Augustine in particular here, he gets quite nasty in this. In, for St. Augustine, this is nasty. Uh, how therefore is she good who without discernment comes to both the good and to the bad? It profits one nothing to worship her. If she is truly fortunate, let the bad worship her, this supposed deity. Um, and uh, this is Fortuna, as the Romans personified her, was the Wheel of Fortune, actually the Wheel of Fortune, the namesake of the game show, uh, right up there. And there's that man who's been riding up the Wheel of Fortune because Fortuna's uh, trolling him. Uh, she's letting him ride up the wheel, and he's feeling great, woo, and you know what's happening next, right? No falling down, because that's what Fortuna did. Um, now, of course, what we think of as, as stochastic processes in the modern day is not really the same as this personification uh, that the Greeks and Romans had, but that's the point. When we think of randomness, um, well, I'm not sure exactly what people think, but uh, analysts, professional statisticians, use it as a description of incomplete information. And the mathematical procedures we use to process that have been very successful in lots of areas. Uh, so that now we have these great historical artifacts. I believe I've showed you this before as well. Books of random numbers, right? Now you can just do this with your computer and you don't need it. But uh, in the early 20th century, publishers started producing these things. They're just books of random numbers. You can imagine future archaeologists discovering these books and being like, Wow, they were crazy. <laughs> a bunch of numbers, or, or a whole dissertation could be could be written just about this one page, decoding it, right? Trying to figure out what the what the message was to those those ahead. <laughs> like, there's some legend here, some some information we have to get out of it. Um, and uh, of course, this is this was designed for agricultural experiments, for doing random plot experiments. Um, so what we're going to do this week is get a conceptual introduction to Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which is another one of these workhorse uh, procedures of Fortuna, uh, a way for us to use chance to learn about uh, a particular thing, that is the deterministic shape of a posterior distribution, which remember is a logical implication of your assumptions. Posterior distributions are not random. They are distributions, but they're a determined thing, determined entirely by the assumptions, the model and the data. But we can use chance, it turns out, to learn the shape of these things. And that's what Markov Chain Monte Carlo is for. It's a way to draw samples from an unknown distribution that we have defined all of the, in principle, all the axioms of, all the information needed to define it, but we're just not smart enough to calculate it any other way. Markov Chain Monte Carlo gives us a really indirect and seemingly insane uh, way to get samples from that distribution. So my goal is just to help you understand it, not to teach you the mathematics of it. Um, and in other courses, you can learn about the mathematics of Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and there was a time when you really had to do that because you had to write these things yourself. They're not that hard to write. I'm going to write a really simple one for you today, the most basic kind. Uh, but these days, we all use packages, which do a way better job of defining the chains and sampling from them than you'd want to do on your own. So I'm going to introduce you instead to using one of these packages, uh, the most powerful convenient desktop package, in my opinion, called STAN. And the Rethinking Library gives you a uh, sort of convenient uh, interface to this. You can use the same kinds of model definitions you've been using so far to define Markov chains. Um, and then as we go forward, you can define new model types in it as well. Uh, I'm going to give you some horoscopic advice, as usual, on um, diagnosing when things go wrong with this new kind of machine, because it's got its own foibles. You you're, you become familiar, I guess, with math estimation, and things would go wrong, right? VM, min, finite, difference, value, something, something happens, and... Uh, so uh, MAP is a hill climbing procedure. It has its own 
issues and foibles. You, you get accustomed to those. Marco Chain Monte Carlo has another set. Um, Marco Chain Monte Carlo is not hill climbing. It's trying to sample from the whole distribution. It's not trying to find any particular point, but give you the whole distribution instead. Uh, uh, and that'll help you understand some of its foibles and ways that you can deal with them. Um, and again, my, my objective is on Thursday, I'll, I'll finish this markup chain content in comfortable enough time that I can start the conceptual introduction to maximum entropy, which we're going to need uh, to understand generalized linear models starting next week. Okay. Um, so I had flashed this guy up before. I want to tell you about markup chain Monte Carlo through a parable, a thought experiment. So forget about computers for, for a second. And imagine that uh, you're an autocrat of an island kingdom. Your name is Markov. And... Uh, you're a hereditary ruler, and your rule is not contested, but unless you want to lose your head, uh, there are certain contractual obligations to your people. In particular, you rule over the metropolis archipelago, um, and this archipelago has a number of islands, uh, only uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them pictured here. Um, and your obligation is uh, that you should visit your people um, in proportion to their population density on each island. That is, the people love you, and they would like to see you. <laughs> they would all like to see you equally as much. And so the, the contract you have with your people is that if there's an island that has twice as much as the next island, you'll spend twice as much time on the island with twice as many people. Right? That's your contractual obligation. You want to visit these islands in proportion to um, uh, their population density. So you need a, rural, uh, a, a royal tour schedule right, to move among these islands is the idea. Um, now, here's the thing. So, uh, King Markov, however, is illiterate in numerate and enumerate, and uh, he's a king, so he's not much interested in, in book learning, and uh, uh, he doesn't like calendars either. He likes, he likes to live in the free spirit. So, uh, uh, he asks his advisors, come up with a way for me to honor this obligation, this contract with my people, uh, without keeping a calendar. So, they go off for a while, and they figure something out, because they're clever, and uh, here's what they come up with. Um, so at any particular point, uh, to say every, every week uh, King Markov is on any particular island, at the end of the week he flips a coin to choose an island on the left or the right of himself in this archipelago. They're ordered, so we can keep moving the archipelago this way. Okay. In, in the book I ask you to imagine it's circular, so we can loop around, uh, which helps with the definition. Um, and so he'll either, half of the time, the coin will indicate the island to the left, and half the time it instead indicates the island to the right. Let's call this island the proposal island, for reasons that will become clear later. It's, it's the island he's proposing moving to. Uh, and step two, um, he finds out the population of that proposal island. He can either send his minions across in a small boat to take a quick census, uh, or he might just, someone might just tell him the name of the island nearby, and he remembers the population density. Uh, whichever. He gets some uh, quick assessment of the population density on the neighboring island, the proposal island. Um, and let's say, let's call that P5, P for population of the fifth island. Um, then he needs the population of the current island. He's on island four, so he gets this number P4. So now he's got um, the, popu rel the populations on each of these two islands, the one he's considering moving to, the proposal island, and the island he's currently on. Uh, so what does he do? Uh, and, and by this point, you're like, we're back in the woods, right? You're wondering, why are we doing this? Let's hang with me, because this is how we sample from posterior distribution. <laughs> this is what it does. Um, step four, we move to the proposal island with probability P5 over P4. And you're like, why? Well, because it works. That's why. No, you can, people derive this stuff, but uh, this actually works. In the book, I describe a way you can do this with, sea, with seashells and pebbles, right? By putting them in a bag, you can actually sample uh, with this probability. Um, but, you know, you can use a spinner or any number of things uh, that non-literate, uh, enumerate kings can use. And uh, so you might move. Um, say you do move. You move to Island 5, and then you wait a week. You spend a week, you know, kissing babies and changing hands. And, receiving gifts from your, from your minions, and then uh, time begins again, and we go back to step one at the end of the week, make a new proposal. Sometimes he'll stay still. So if, if he finds himself on an island with a particularly high population density, for example, then chances are that in this ratio, P5 to P4, will be less than one, right? Because the island he's on, the current island, is in the denominator, and it'll be a bigger number. So he'll, he'll stay on big islands, 
Uh, and on small islands, you'll kind of just flip right across them. Stay a week and say bye. Uh, I've kissed all your babies. And uh, he moves on to the next island. Um, and it's that particular property that makes this work. Uh, and this does work. It seems like madness. Um, but this is an, a working instantiation of an algorithm of uh, one of the most famous Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms it's called the Metropolis algorithm. It's named after a person that I'll introduce you to in a few slides. Um, and here is a complete R script for running uh, King Markov's wild tour uh, that you saw in the previous slides. It's just this. And I'm not going to walk through this code with you in any detail, but I do want to quickly go through and give you an idea functionally what it's doing. And there's comments in here to help you understand it. This is intermediate level scripting. There's actually some programming going on finally in this course, right? As opposed to just like poking my package with your commands, making it squeal, right? Uh, so at the top, at the top, that, these metaphors sometimes go really wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm doing this on the fly, right? Okay. The number of weeks... After I heard that, I was like, wow. <laughs> I said that out loud. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, num.weeks is just how many weeks we're going to run the simulation over. Um, and then we make a vector of positions. Uh, uh, just put zero in there to initialize the whole thing. That's equal to the length of number of weeks. We're just going to record the history in that vector. This is, it's very important, though, and I wanted to say this. In R, you always pre-allocate your vectors when you do stuff like this. Because if you increase the length of a vector in R, it has to actually make the new empty vector and then copy your old vector into the other parts of it. And that's really slow. Anything that involves making a new variable in R is super slow. How slow? Two orders of magnitude slower than just starting with the thing as long as you need it to be. If you don't know how long it will be, make it twice as long as you think you will ever need it. That's still going to be faster. Uh, your, your computers have gigabytes upon gigabytes of room for like cat photos, right? So uh, <laughs> you, can, you can double the size of your vectors and be fine. Uh, we Current is where King Markov is right now. We just put him on island 10. And in this, I'm going to say that the island's index is also its relative population size. Just make it easy. That doesn't have to be the case. And then there's just a loop. We loop over the weeks in a for loop. Um, first, we, re we record where the king is right now. We put that in, in the ith position in positions. Uh, we flip his coin, right, and get a proposal island is the current plus or minus one. That's what we're sampling, a minus one or a plus one. And then this is just bookkeeping so that we loop around. There's no island 11. Island 11 is island one. Right? And then we just do an if-else to see if he moves. We construct the ratio proposal over current, and we generate a random number. Uh, if it's, if uh, the probability of moving is greater than that random number, he moves. Otherwise, he stays still. Just keep doing this. And this works. Let me show you what the simulations look like. Um, uh, here's the string starting with week one on the far left all the way up to a, a week 1,000 over there. And then the island indices are on the vertical. And each blue dot is the position of a king at any particular point. This looks pretty random. It is. He's drifting around. But it turns out he's drifting around in a precise way that in the long run, uh, he exactly spends uh, the right proportion amount of time on each island in proportion to its population size. Uh, now, long run is really long. In fact, he will die <laughs> before he gets a good sample, probably, with this, because we'll talk about this later. The Metropolis algorithm, it's honest, and it works, but it takes a very long time. His, his heir will have to fulfill, keep fulfilling this contract and pick up with his schedule as it left off. But in the very long run, uh, it'll work fine. From the perspective of any particular island, especially the small ones, it may be a long time before he comes back, before he drifts back in. Um, it makes it easier to see this if we connect these with lines. Now you can see the path a little bit better. And there's some looping around that goes on. It looks quite random. But if we take this collection uh, of points and we collapse them together like a histogram, just take every position in each week and treat it as a bunch of data now from some distribution. There's a distribution of positions. Position is an island. And we want to know the distribution of those positions. We just collapse all together and make a histogram of it. And we can do that. And I'll show you. Uh, th uh, at different time steps in this um, sequence. On the left, after only 100 weeks, the histogram is still pretty jagged. You see he is spending twice as much time on Island 10 as any other island, um, but it hasn't quite settled down in the others. Uh, but after 500 weeks, it's starting to look pretty good. Uh, after 2,000 weeks, it's a little better. Um, and I told you it was a really long run. And then after 10,000 weeks, it's basically exact. Uh, a little bit of error off. And this is the guarantee. Um, 
and uh, uh, King Markov honors his contract to his people by using the Metropolis algorithm. Um, in the long run, this is what you want Markov chains to do. You're drawing samples from some distribution, and the guarantee, if you've defined it correctly, is that in the long run, uh, those the individual values will be drawn in proportion to their <laughs> probability in what's called the target distribution, the distribution you'd like to visualize but could not compute uh, before. Uh, for us, this will be a posterior distribution of a Bayesian analysis, uh, but it could be other things too. Uh, this is a Markov chain Monte Carlo is a general procedure for sampling from unanalyzable target distributions of some kind. So it's a great way to do that. Um, it doesn't matter where the king starts, in fact. Uh, and this simplest algorithm works as long as the proposals are symmetric, meaning it has an equal chance of going up the island chain and down. There are more general methods I'll give you a, a more conceptual introduction to in a moment, which don't require symmetry. And in fact, not requiring symmetry makes things more efficient. Uh, that's one of the ways to get things out of it. Um, so this is the Metropolis algorithm. Just quickly, a little bit of history, because I think the intellectual history of these things is, is pretty interesting. Uh, uh, this is named after the lead uh, scientist of a team that worked on a bunch of stuff, including fusion bombs, uh, and published this paper, this famous paper, with a horrible title, Equation of State Calculations by Fast Computing Machines, which used the Metropolis algorithm to simulate, I think it was, uh, neutron decay in fusion uh, reactors or something like that. It was uh, an atomic physics problem. And uh, this was, you know, the Manhattan Project people, uh, Ed Teller and those folks working on blowing up things, right? Uh, we're not going to blow up anything with our Markov chains, but this is one of the first applications of it. Um, and it's interesting, uh, it's a great paper title, it's Metropolis, who, Nick Metropolis, who uh, led the group, uh, Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, Teller, and Teller. Uh, that's Marshall Rosenbluth, who was a famous uh, atomic physicist, and Ed Teller, also often called the father of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and their spouses, who were computer programmers, because in this period, computer IT was entirely, computer programming was almost entirely a female profession. The guys did math, they did the math here, and the women actually built the machines and did it. So there's a cool history here where I think it was uh, Augusta Teller uh, uh, took apart a bicycle and used it, to and then made magnetic tape and rounded around the wheel of this disconstructed bicycle to feed it into the machine that she had etched with a magnet, the program code, on the magnetic tape she had wrapped around the bicycle wheel. It was because they made this, it was, all computers were one off at this time, right? They had their own operating systems and machine languages, and I think it was Augusta designed that whole system and had to feed this you know, magnetic tape wrapped around the bicycle wheel into the machine. It's an incredible history. There's a whole book about it. Uh, and this fascinating stuff uh, the, on the cutting edge of, you know, blowing up islands. But uh, <laughs> uh, really amazing achievements. Here's the computer they used pictured in the background there. This was all like vacuum tubes and, and stuff like that. Uh, it was called Maniac. Uh, that's Nick uh, Metropolis, the vaguely handsome fellow in the, in the vest in front. This is very mad man, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I expect him to have, have an old-fashioned. He's got the cigarette. That's one part of it, but because everybody smoked constantly around computer hardware. <laughs> um, I don't know who the fellow is in the back, unfortunately. I should find out. But uh, that's Maniac in the back, part of its racks and everything. That's the machines that they were, like, feeding magnetic tape into uh, to reprogram it. It had no keyboard, right? You had to etch the program with bits on magnetic tape and then feed it in. Uh, Maniac was, uh, it's a horrible acronym, but it was made as a joke by Nick Metropolis, he later wrote, he says he was already sick of acronyms back then, that always had, everything had to have an acronym that made some cute word, and he was already sick of it. Yeah, this was the 1950s, so they were already sick of acronyms. We, we are just drowning in them now. Now we have self-referential acronyms, right, that like loop back on themselves and all kinds of stuff. So uh, it didn't work. But anyway, it stood for Mathematical Analyzer, Numerical Integrator, and Compiler, kind of contrived. And it did simulate, you know, nuclear explosions, so there's some mania involved. This was a thousand pound monster, five kilobytes of memory, which is such a small amount. <laughs> you know, most of you have probably have memory sticks in your bags, which are, what, eight gigabytes or more right now? Those are the cheap ones, eight gigabytes. You get those in cereal boxes, I think. <laughs> and uh, could do 70,000 multiplications per second, which sounds pretty fast, uh, but actually is really slow. Your laptop, uh, bottom of the line laptop, uh, like buy a Chromebook or something, right, for 200 bucks. And... Uh, it's going to be, well, it'll be like one pound, but 47 pounds, two to eight million kilobytes of memory, uh, and billions of multiplications a second, no, without any optimization, just incredible uh, difference, and um, 
Uh, and now we look at pictures of cats. But <laughs> uh, anyway, it's we're, we can do some much fancier stuff is the point I want to make now than the struggles I went through to get the basic metropolis algorithm working. This was a huge breakthrough because it provided a way to simulate values from a distribution that could not be calculated analytically. And there are lots of good problems that can be defined completely based on their assumptions, but we can't close the intervals usually. Nobody can. You can still get famous in math with solving intervals, right? That's that's how intervals are. And um, it's not like taking derivatives is easy, right? There's some rules, but but the reverse process is the inverse process is, can be really hard. So this is a way to do inter integral calculus. Uh, I've told you before we use samples in this class as a way of tricking you into doing integral calculus. Yeah, the same thing. Your computer's going to be doing in a very indirect fashion. Lots of cool integral calculus. Um, so. A little bit about the definitions. Metropolis is named after Nick Metropolis, uh, a simple version of Markov chain Monte Carlo. The chain in Markov chain Monte Carlo refers to the sequence of draws. It's the path that King Markov took among the islands. That's what we call a chain. <coughs> it's a chain because his what he does at any particular point depends upon where he is right now. Uh, but notice it does not depend upon any earlier positions. Right? His algorithm only depends upon his current position. None of his none of the history matters. And that's the Markov part, uh, named after this fellow, Andrei Andreevich Markov. Uh, and uh, his, his son, you have to be careful, his son was also a mathematician and had the same name. <laughs> but this is the one who studied stochastic processes. And they're both relatively famous. But uh, this is the first one who studied stochastic processes. And lots of, lots of things in stochastic processes have the word Markov attached to them uh, after this fellow. So Markov means we're studying a stochastic process where history is irrelevant. All that matters is the current state of the system. And that's true in the Metropolis algorithm because it doesn't matter if you visited Island 3 200 rounds ago. All that matters is what island you're on right now. And that affects the probability that you're going to move to either of the neighboring islands or stay in place. Make sense? That's the Markov part. History doesn't matter. Yeah? I have a question about, it may be just a silly technical question, but if, if the only movement of the portion was greater than on the other island than where he was now, that's not right. So it's a, that's the, the probability he moves is the ratio of those two numbers. And if oh, it's great, yeah, the probability. And then he uses a, like a bag or a spinner or something. Exactly. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, I'm, I'm more precise in talking through the algorithm in the book. So I'll, I'll lean on the notes a bit here. Um, so, yeah, and then the Monte Carlo part uh, of this refers to random simulation after gambling. Because there was a place called Monte Carlo. Has anyone here been there? Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty strange. It's like Disneyland for absurdly rich people. It's, uh, uh, and anyway, so I, I think it was uh, von Neumann who, who, although these people tell stories about this, you can never confirm them, who proposed the idea of calling stochastic simulation Monte Carlo uh, as a joke uh, to play on the gambling. Yeah. So my, what would be a Monte Carlo simulation without a Monte Carlo? Anything that uses random numbers. Any stochastic simulation is a Monte Carlo simulation. So, but if you, if you use history... Then it wouldn't be Markov, okay. right? If more than the current state matters for determining the stochasticity, the, the processes, uh, the time course evolution of the system, then it's not a Markov chain. Uh, lots of things can be made into Markov processes if you're clever, because you can define a huge number of states. Some of those states can involve <coughs> history. Uh, so there are ways of defining it so that you, there are tricks involved uh, to do stuff that you think history matters, but you can still make a Markov chain in the body that it's weird. Yeah, yes. So um, to go back to the island analogy, um, if there were two or more islands that were non-sequential with populations approximately zero, then there would be basically isolated islands that the King Markov would never visit. He would never visit them, yeah. Um, exactly. Those wouldn't even be in the set, right? Those are, as we'll get to later, that's like, those islands have a prior of zero, so they're they're not even in the range of possible states in the system, right? If they're zero, but you mean approximately zero? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He'll hardly ever visit them, right? And in, and it may take many many lifetimes of kings uh, before anyone visits those islands. Actually, if there's like one hermit on a tiny desert island, right? Gilligan is out there on some things. Yeah. Well, like if if there's that one island with the one person on it, and then there's an island like across from that. That you need to go through that island to get to with a very large mm. population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah, yeah. Then this system, the the this metropolis system, is going to be inefficient uh, in that it may have to loop around the other way, or it'll have trouble getting through the state. That's right. 
And this is that's one of the issues that we're gonna. This is why we don't use raw metropolis usually. Uh, this works uh, if you define it right, but it may take a really long time and it might be hugely inefficient. So we don't use it for the most part. Okay, that's just the vocabulary. Give you some idea what this MC MC thing is, right? Um, our use, as I said, is to draw samples from a posterior distribution. Uh, posterior distribution, we don't have to do map estimation, and we don't have to make quadratic assumptions. Uh, use any prior you like, any likelihood you like, um, as long as you can program a Markov chain uh, with it, and you can, I'll show you how, uh, you can draw samples from it. And um, the islands uh, are parameter values, they're particular states, the, you make their I want to think of it as positions of the system, okay, but we're drawing parameter values from this distribution. So the positions of the king are now the parameter values for some particular dimension in the model. And population size is, is proportional to posterior probability. We get that from the product of the likelihood in the prior. Right? That's where we get the things that go into that ratio of the transition probabilities. Uh, the top is the product of the likelihood in prior for the other parameter value you're proposing moving to, and the bottom is the product of the likelihood of prior for the parameter value you were at last time, and you're still at right now in a sense. Uh, and then you may move or you may stay in the same place. And uh, if you stay in the same place at some parameter value for a long time, that's because it has high posterior probability relative to the proposals that are there. Yeah? So the history doesn't matter, but if the king remembers how many people are on the islands, is that a form of history? Maybe I don't care. Okay. I mean, it's not. It's not. I mean, no. I mean, I don't mean to press it up, but it's not. In terms of defining the Markov chain, no. I mean, you're right. Yeah, sure. We just got to get. We got to know the likelihood function. We got to be able to make calculations in here, uh, at least conditional on each parameter at a time. Absolutely. So whether that's history or not. But the reason to do it is because we don't know. The reason to use this is because we don't know. We don't have any information. We can't calculate the whole posterior distribution analytically. Uh, this will work because we can actually cut up pieces of it. Uh, we, can, we can do little bits of the formula one at a time. Uh, when you update any, any particular parameter dimension, there's a little bit more about this in the notes, uh, you don't necessarily have to consider all the other dimensions in the model at the same time, and that's what makes it computationally feasible. Uh, it's a trick. There's this thing called a Markov blanket, which I almost made a slide for, because it's very tempting, right? Great Markov blanket, but my art skills failed, so I, I hit the slide. But that uh, has to do with figuring out for any particular update, for any particular parameter, which other dimensions in the posterior you can ignore. Uh, speak casually. So there's a way to do that. If you read read uh, the mathier books about this stuff, they'll talk about Markov blankets and things like that. That, that comes up with Gibbs sampling that we're talking about next. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so this works for any number of dimensions, parameters. So it, it, it may not just be the, the island chain array out. It might be, I don't know, elevation of buildings in them, too, <laughs> something like that. Um, but in models, we have many different dimensions. Each dimension is a parameter. And uh, we, we need combinations of We need posterior probability for combinations uh, in those dimensions. So that's what we're sampling from. Uh, and the island example is discrete, but of course our parameters uh, are typically not. It still works. Um, the proposals don't have to be discrete, uh, and it'll still work as long as they're symmetrical. Okay. Um, so yeah, why do we do this? Uh, we do this when we can't write an integrated likelihood function. And for the models we've done so far, you, you can. You can uh, uh, do the optimization hill climbing because you can get a full likelihood for all the parameters at once by averaging things together. Um, <coughs> There are going to be models coming up soon where this is not possible. And when we get there, I'll, I'll give you some vague idea about why. Uh, but no one can close the intervals. Uh, so you can't, you don't have a single function you can call, which gives you for all the parameter values um, the probability of the data. Uh, but you can do it piecewise. And uh, uh, the usual case that we run into this and in, in the main use in this class is multi level models. In multi level models, there are, in the, since there's more than one level, there are these dimensions in the model. They're going to be the varying effects parameters, which look like data from one perspective, and they look like parameters from another. And they have an identity crisis. And this makes the integral calculus difficult, depending upon other assumptions you make. And in general, for multi-level models, you can't close the intervals. And you're stuck doing something else, some kind of averaging. Markov chain Monte Carlo is not the only option, uh, but it's a very good and general one. Um, there are other ones you'll hear about, like uh, uh, expectation maximization, uh, which work as well for lots of model types. Um, but MCMC is very general and useful. 
uh, so I'm going to teach you it instead. And some network and phylog phylogenetic models as well, lots, lots of spatial models. Um, so there are a, a bunch of Marco Chain Monte Carlo uh, strategies that are, they're all in some sense variants of a metropolis process, uh, uh, whether conceptually or analytically. Um, the closest one to it is the so-called metropolis Hastings. It's the same kind of process, but you don't have to have symmetrical proposals. Uh, and that allows, opens up a bunch of, of different ways to improve these algorithms because um, there's this truism, I kind of I quoted in this chapter in the book, that if, if you can do something, if there's a random way of doing something, then there's probably a non-random way of doing it that's better. But that non-random way is going to require more effort. Uh, so doing it randomly is not bad, but it costs you on, on the back end. Uh, with the non-random ways, you put in effort up front, and you get a more efficient process. And the descendants of Metropolis all remove some of the randomness and make intelligent proposals of some kind instead of random proposals. Right? So think about uh, King Markov's thing. He knows if he's on Island 10, he's probably not going to move to Island 1. So he shouldn't make that proposal because he's just going to reject it. Uh, he'd like to move every week. So he'd like to make proposals to islands which are plausible moves, given where he currently is. And that, that would give you uh, some of these descendant methods as we go down. Uh, Gibbs sampling is the most famous. This is an efficient version of Metropolis Hastings. I'll say a little bit more about it on the next couple slides. Um, and we're going to focus on a newer one uh, called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, or HMC, sometimes called hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, with the same acronym. And I'll say more about that as well. Uh, uh, all of these are still in use. They're all useful. And this is an area of rapid research. It wasn't until the 1990s that this became a big deal on the desktop, fitting statistical models with Markov chains. There's a lot of active research and computational statistics on this. I figure in a decade, someone will come up with an even new GWIS way to do things. Um, uh, well, you know, 10 years ago, around the year 2000, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo didn't really exist. Uh, there, were, there were people working on uh, um, systems of analysis like that. Uh, but as applications, it didn't exist. And everybody thought Gibbs sampling was like the thing. Now Gibbs sampling looks pretty awful in comparison. Uh, although it's still useful. So who knows, in another decade, uh, we'll have some more stuff. Um, remember, Bayesian statistics was outlawed in most stats departments for the second half of the 20th century. So uh, now that it is not outlawed anymore, um, uh, research is moving apace. And uh, there's lots of effort on these things. Also, the more complex kinds of models are of interest now. Um, OK, so let me give you a conceptual version of Gibbs sampling. Uh, the Metropolis algorithm requires symmetrical proposals. Metropolis Hastings doesn't. Uh, you can have asymmetric proposals left and right. You give yourself some drift. Uh, but in general, you can, the proposal can be a function that you draw from it. It can be a function of your state, so the kinds of proposals you make, where is the movement proposed. And what you'd like to do is choose a proposal function that makes smart proposals which are likely to be accepted. Why? Because that means you'll keep moving. And you'll efficiently sample. Every calculation will give you a new sample instead of sitting on island 10 forever. Uh, and that makes the chain more efficient, and it helps it do something called, uh, called mix, uh, which is something we're going to want our chains to do, is have them be mixed well, uh, well mixed, uh, so that we're moving constantly. Uh, we're not wasting computation sitting still. And uh, Gibbs sampling achieves uh, clever uh, proposals. <laughs> Um, by using analytical slices through the posterior distribution. I say more about this in the notes. Um, I'm not going to say more about it here because we're not going to use it, so I decided not to, not to spend lecture time on it. Um, the, the point is, though, it, gets us, it can only do this if you choose certain priors, so-called conjugate priors. And each likelihood function has its own conjugate prior, if it has any. Um, what does that mean? Uh, conjugate pairs are pairs of... Um, formal uh, uh, probability distributions for a prior and the likelihood, which you can close the interval for so that you can solve for the posterior distribution. Uh, and it's not required that um, uh, the whole model uh, that you'd be able to solve for the posterior di distribution, because if that were true, we wouldn't be doing this, right? If we just write down the solution. Instead, all Gibbs sampling requires is for each parameter uh, uh, that it's the likelihood and, and the family of priors that you assign to it be conjugate so that you can close it. So there are lots of famous ones. Um, uh, for Gaussian model, the mean of uh, a normal prior on the mean gives you a normal posterior. Uh, 
right? And then for the standard deviation, inverse gamma turns out to be uh, the conjugate prior, which and then now you're like, what? The inverse what? <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about that later. Gamma distribution is actually really useful, uh, but not, not in the case of using it as a conjugate prior. Um, so this is a constraint. Uh, and I happen not to like it because these conjugate priors often have inconvenient features near a boundary in parameter space. So they've fallen out of fashion. Um, GIB sampling is the basis of the software packages like bugs and JAGs that end in GS. That GS stands for GIB sampling. Uh, bugs is Bayesian inference using GIB sampling, and JAGs is just another GIB sampler. Right? Got to have an acronym. <laughs> right? And uh, bugs and JAGs are great, in particular JAGs. Uh, if you want to, if you've got some problem, you're going to do GIB sampling with it. Uh, you can use JAGS. There are lots of great books which have ready-to-go bugs and JAGS code for doing all kinds of useful model types. Uh, that, all that remains very useful. Um, but GIP sampling can be frustrating. Uh, first, let me show you what's great about it compared to regular old Metropolis Hastings. Generalized Metropolis Hastings without intelligent proposals um, can take a really long time to get near the high-density region of the posterior distribution. What I'm showing you on this slide is um, the top-down view of samples from a posterior distribution taken from two different Markov chains on the left, a Gibbs sampling chain, on the right, ordinary metropolis chain, and this is a simple linear regression, you say we're just estimating the mean and the standard deviation, right, using a Gaussian likelihood, so two-dimensional, um, and we start the chains in the same place in the lower right, in both cases, far from the actual target area, and what you see is Metropolis, like King Markov, takes forever, wanders, and drifts very slowly, but it's wandering around, then eventually gets into the hot spot that stays there. Doesn't drift back out again. Stays on Island 10, doesn't even visit Gilligan. Can I see about Gilligan? Besides you? Yeah. So, um, uh, so it gets there and it does its job, uh, but you've got this long, this is often called the burn in, uh, right, where it's spending all its time wandering into the target zone. And, um, uh, Gibbs sampling takes exactly two steps to get there. Exactly two. Boom, boom. Uh, right there, it's in the party zone, and then it zigzags around and traverses, and you see it's hairier. Is that a technical term? It looks like a furball, right? Because uh, it's moving faster across the space. It's not standing still. Metropolis stays still a lot, so you get those, those straight line segments in the plot on the right. Um, and this makes it way more efficient. You need a lot less time to get an equally good picture of the posterior distribution. Does that make sense? And that's why it's popular. Uh, it was a big revolution in desktop computing for Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Um, the problem with Gibbs sampling, uh, one of the problems, other than the conjugate prior problem, um, is uh, when you have a high dimensional model, and you will, uh, it tends to get stuck because some of the dimensions, some of the, some of the pairs of parameters or sets of parameters will be highly correlated with one another in the posterior distribution. I'm going to show you this um, several slides in, a few slides from now. I'm going to show you what that looks like. As a consequence, so Gibbs sampling is jumping in each dimension one at a time. It's doing these traverse intelligent jumps along particular dimensions in the model. Um, and since it's only considering one parameter at a time, it can't see these kind of funnels of high probability. I'm going to show you a picture of this later. And so it tends to get stuck in little corners. Um, and this is horrible. Sometimes it'll, it, you don't have a long enough lifespan to wait for this thing to converge, actually. For high-dimensional multi-level models, it can be a big problem. Well, it's high-dimensional, you know, 20,000 parameters, right? Which is not unusual these days, to fit models with 20,000 parameters. So uh, the other thing about it is it's still pretty inefficient because um, it's jumping around at random. All it remembers is where it was last time. And that's... That makes it a Markov chain. So what's annoying about that is what you'd really like your little king to do is sweep across the islands, right? Why can't King Markov just like have a schedule where he stays on island 10 for 10 days, then moves to island 9 and stays there for 9 days, and then moves to island 8 and stays for 8 days? And the answer, of course, is because he's illiterate and numerate, right? And he's a king, whatever. <laughs> but uh, that would be a good schedule because then you're, you're going in a sequence and you're still honoring your contract. You want to sweep across the posterior distribution so that you get a picture of the tails, and then you don't want to hang out in the tail over here. You want to sweep back across. And you want to spend more time in the middle where there's more probability, uh, but you want to sweep across these dimensions. Uh, Gibbs sampling doesn't do that. It just erratically jumps around because it has no memory, right? That's what makes it a Markov chain. So there is uh, uh, a solution to this, a partial solution, and it's called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, and it, it uh, Now, here's the wild thing about Hamiltonian uh, Monte Carlo, it runs a physics simulation. 
It's named after Hamiltonian dynamics from physics. Anybody here was a physics major? Uh, Paul's not here today, so he was going to be my hand, but he's not here. Um, Hamiltonian dynamics is equivalent to classical uh, uh, Newtonian uh, dynamics as well as Lagrangian dynamics. They're just different mathematical systems for describing motion in multidimensional systems. The Hamiltonian is parameterized by a vector of positions and momentum, so. And these are the things we're going to want because what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does is it simulates a little particle moving in n-dimensional space. What is this n-dimensional space? It's the dimension of your model of the parameter space. Uh, and it's, it's a, what's the particle? That's like King Markov. That's where he is at this particular time. But now King Markov is a hockey puck. And at the start of the simulation, you whack this hockey puck really hard and you impart momentum to it in some particular direction. And it glides on a frictionless surface in n-dimensional space. What is this frictionless surface? It's the posterior, it's the log posterior. It's like a big, slightly curved hockey rink. Anybody here play hockey? Yeah, no? Man, yeah, there's a bunch of heathens <laughs> in here. It's a noble sport. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but not for the squeamish. And uh, anyway, so there's not a lot of friction on a hockey rink. That's my point. So this thing is flying along, and while it slows it down, is eventually it starts going uphill. Uh, because there's curvature in the log posterior, and that makes it turn around. And we take time samples of the location of this hockey puck uh, uh, as it moves around at different speeds, and those time samples are vectors of samples from the posterior distribution. If you define the simulations correctly, uh, it seems like madness, but this is still a Markov chain, and it still gives you the right solutions. In the long run, it converges to the posterior distribution you see. And it's really efficient because it's making good proposals. The proposals are where the puck is heading. And the puck is heading towards, well, it's, it's a physics simulation. So it's, a, it's obeying the potential energy of the curvature of this thing. So it's cruising in the direction of least energy resistance, right? That's the way the physics works. And that makes the, the proposals likely to be accepted. In fact, they're guaranteed to be accepted in this case because it's deterministic. Um, and it's traversing the posterior distribution instead of randomly jumping around it. And there is a clever way to do this so that it's time reversible, which makes it so you can satisfy all the Markov chain properties. It's actually it's a feature of Hamiltonian dynamics is that they're time reversible. Um, one of the things you would have done. So I was going to reference Paul. But Paul's not here. Damn you, Paul. Um, so uh, you don't need to understand the details of this. If you are interested, the book I showed a few slides back, the Handbook of Markov Chain Monte Carlo, has a great chapter. It really is where there's pseudocode. Uh, I think there's actually a page with some R code in it. And you can run a simple Hamiltonian simula simulation. So if you're interested in the details, go there. That's where I refer you to. I cite it in the chapter as well. But you don't need to know the details of that. There's, there's division of labor in this business. And there are people that write uh, these samplers. And you can define your model within the general structure. And that's what we're going to do. I do think it's good to have some sense of the basic algorithm, though, so that you can diagnose misbehavior. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. Let me give you the animated version of that story. Let's imagine that King Markov has a brother who lives on the mainland. His name is Monty. And uh, he has a kingdom, but his kingdom is arrayed along a straight line. It's just a bunch of urban. It's a continuous city. It's like the Southlands, right? If you know Los Angeles, yeah. And uh, uh, it's just like a bunch of cities that grew like cancer into one another, right? And uh, let's imagine we just take the whole of the Southlands and array them in a straight line. So that just so it's one dimension, we all, all we have to think about. Now, King Monty's got the same contract. He needs to visit his people in proportion to their population density, which is strewn about continuously in this urban landscape. Um, so what does Monty do? Well, he gets in his car, uh, and he's going to start driving. And let's see if my animation works. Uh, and the way he needs to do this is he needs to have a function of his, his relative speed at any particular point in his journey it needs to be a function of the population density. An inverse function, because he wants to move more slowly through the dense area so that he can shake more hands out of his car window and kiss more babies and stuff like that, right? And then when he gets into the boondocks out at the end, he speeds up, puts the pedal to the metal, and just kind of like waves really rapidly at people as he goes by. Uh, and then he gets to the end and he turns back around. Um, so the, the log population density gives us the relative speed. That's the idea. That's what that bucket is there. So if it's a Gaussian population distribution, which I kind of tried to draw with my, with my buildings, <laughs> um, then it'll look like a parabola, right? That's the idea. Uh, so he starts driving, and uh, yeah, let's see, watch this. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so he starts driving along, and he slows down, gets really slow in the middle, kissing lots of babies right now. And we're getting, so in the real version, we're taking time samples at even time intervals as he goes, and those give us locations. 
And so we can actually get the population density back from his position at different time points. Um, that's how Hamiltonian Monte Carlo works. But it's doing it in a bunch of dimensions, not just one at the same time. So it's hard to visualize. Imagine this in 22,000 dimensional space. Uh -huh. And Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does all the dimensions at once, all of them. Uh, and this is the this is its biggest feature, I think. Oh yeah, I think it's the end, and he turns back around. Okay, so here's the summary: um, tr the population density curve is our log posterior, uh, and all we actually need is the log posterior at the point we're at. We need its curvature where we are in order to predictively simulate where we're heading. Um, the position of the car is a vector of parameter values. The speed of the car, uh, the momentum of the parameter values. You want to go fast when you're um, high up. On the log posterior, you want to get slow down when you're low. But momentum is governing how this works, and that guides you through this individual surface so that you're, you're moving through the area of high acceptance of proposals. Um, and then, yeah, there's a step size, so to speak, where there are time intervals where we check on the position of the car and record that position as a bunch of parameter values, a sample from the posterior distribution. And this works. It's pretty cool. Um, like I said, there's a great chapter by Radford Neal in that handbook, uh, where there's just a little bit of R code. It's one page long to do this whole thing. It's not that bad. So let me give you an idea of what I mean. So imagine you've got a model where there are two anonymous parameters, and the posterior distribution, the high-density region, is shown by this ellipse. This happens a lot. You've already seen it in your models, right? Say, like an intercept and a slope in a, in a simple linear regression. In multi-level models, this happens. Varying effects are always highly correlated with one another, always, uh, nearly always. And so there's nothing wrong with this. It's just a challenge. You want to draw samples from this thing. Gibbs sampling takes slices through each dimension in turns. So what ends up happening is it gets stuck in little corners here. So if we start here, it's going to take a jump to the right in dimension one, and then, okay, that, that proposal is very likely to get accepted. Uh, but then it's going to take a jump up in the other dimension, and then a jump left, and so on. And it can just, like, stick around in tiny regions, stuck in a corner. What it, if it could see the tilt to this thing and see that this is the major dimension, right? there's an axis that combines both parameters, then it would jump in that direction. But it can't because that isn't what the algorithm does. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo finds those dimensions and it zigzags along right? the, the low energy paths in this thing. Uh, it, it really solves this problem extremely well. Now, it creates other problems. Remember, uh, this is part of that truism that there's a random way to do something. There's a better non-random way that requires more thought. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is computationally very expensive. It really is running hundreds of physics simulations at every sampling event. Uh, but you don't need as many samples. You don't have to run the chain for as many iterations because the individual samples have very low correlation with one another and are highly informative of the overall shape of the distribution. Uh, so it's great. Let me show you a quick movie uh, before we do a little work with these things. Here's a great... Um, Animation, some uh, computational statisticians made to compare the two. You're looking at Metropolis right now, crawling along posterior distributions in the shape of the letters Harlem Shake. And uh, you'll notice the only one that's doing well is the one on the O in the middle. The, the thin posterior distributions of the other letters, it's just ziggling around, right? It can't move. Now Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on the same shape. You'll notice it finds the ridges and crawls along them. So look at the S in particular. It's really grooving on the S there uh, and dances around because uh, that's its job. Whatever, wherever the high density path is, that's where the puck goes. Um, so th this is cool. Uh, you can watch this in your own free time. So I'll leave this up here to see. Uh, I think the, the people that made this movie did, uh, uh, deserve a reward of some kind, <laughs> uh, maybe just a thank you note or something, but it's a great teaching tool. Uh, and in practice, the way this manifests for us is that if you use random, uh, classic <coughs> metropolis, which is just a random walk, um, looking at iterations across the horizontal, it wanders around. It's just a, it's just a random walk. It's Brownian in motion. Right? It's just wandering around. If the proposals are Gaussian, it really is Brownian in motion, and, uh, uh, at least locally. And so it's very inefficient because it takes it a long time to get the whole shape. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, in contrast, it looks like those, the samples you pull from that. Where, where it is already defining the distribution. They're really well mixed up, right? So there's very low correlation from one sample to the next, and that's a sign that it's efficiently exploring the space. Uh, so you want, to, you want the situation on the right, I assert, and not the situation on the left. Um, and that's what we get from Hamiltonian dynamics. So we're going to use STAN. Uh, I know some of you have fought with this and, and won. Uh, the only thing you had to fight with it was your C++ compiler, right? 
and there have been victories in out there. Um, if you haven't tried this yet, this is your mission. You must do this. As your homework uh, coming up is going to require running these things. And then for the rest of the course, we're going to be running Markov chains. There is no opting out of this. Uh, this is now default PhD level skill. You need to know multi-level models and how to run Markov chains. Right? You can't opt out. You want a job, right? Different opt out. Uh, <laughs> and I don't mean that to scare you. It's just this is true. When I was in grad school, it was like if you knew multiple regression, you were a hot shot. Uh, <laughs> but it isn't like that anymore. Right now, you're expected to launch rockets. And stuff. So, uh, luckily, this is not rocket science. We can get this installed in a nice, safe environment uh, where we are not ashamed of our computing errors. And uh, I will usher you through this, and we'll get it going, and uh, you'll love it. So, go here and do it if you haven't yet. Um, Stan implements Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but it has its own algorithm uh, called NUTS, uh, the No U Turn Sampler. I know, but it's this disease. Or <laughs> with acronyms. Uh, uh, and the no U-turn sampler is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but it's adaptive, meaning it figures out the step size and other aspects of the of the physics simulations that make it more efficient. So when you run it, and we'll, I'll show you this in, in a few minutes, um, there's going to be this warm-up phase or adaptation phase where it's tuning the process. It's not taking samples from the posterior yet, but it's figuring out, out how to efficiently do it. Um, and when it does, that's the adaptive part. In the absence of this artificial intelligence that's doing the adaptation for you, you would have to tweak a bunch of knobs about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, about your Markov chain to make it work well. Uh, this is also true of Metropolis. Uh, the step size in Metropolis is tunable as well, and often you would have to do that as well. All these things require some hand tuning, unless you've got an artificial intelligence like Stan does. Uh, there are some models that Stan doesn't do a good job with, but all the kind of typical ones we'll use in this class, it, it does the best job. There's no other tool on your desktop that's going to do as good a job as this. It'll be really good. Best thing about Stan, um, and I'll show you this later, if not today, on Thursday, when it doesn't work, it's really obvious. Uh, this is a huge advantage. Um, the GS tools, like bugs and jags that give samplers, when they don't work, the chains look basically the same as when they do work. They look like random walks. Uh, and that's very troubling. You're trying to figure out whether you've done something wrong, and you can't tell as easily. With Stan, when you've done something wrong, it is blindingly obvious. And this is why I cherish it as a tool. Helps me see my idiocy really obviously on the screen, right? And we're all idiots at least half the day, so uh, uh, we need tools that announce that to us. So what what Stan does is you input a model formula. Um, well, we're going to use Map to Stan, so you can keep using the same formula sets you've had before. Um, but there's this translation phase. You provide the model formula. Uh, Map to Stan builds that into a Stan model, which you have access to if you want. I, Talk about this in the chapter. And later on, if you want to do fancier models, you can program directly in Stan. It looks very similar to what you've done already. Um, Stan then compiles that into C++ code. That C++ code is then passed to your C++ compiler. Now, there's a million chains here. Um, and that makes a reusable sampler, an executable, that's a little Markov chain with just your model. And you can feed new data into it and draw samples from that posterior. You can reuse the thing. Uh, so it's, it's a redeployable thing that's independent of R once you've built it. We're going to do it all in R because it's convenient because it, we can call that thing automatically, that little executable, and draw samples, and then they can get populated directly into R's memory, and we're going to process them like every other set of samples we've used so far because they're just samples, right? This is where you now see the, 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 the wisdom to my madness earlier of forcing you to work with samples since, since the first week, right? It was crazy back then, and it was. Uh, but now you're pros at working with samples, right? Yes, not, yeah. Uh, and uh, I see some skepticism out there, but you are. You're pretty good at it. And uh, none of that changes. You work with the output of these models exactly the same way. The models are different, so you still have to struggle to understand the new model types. Uh, but processing the inferences stays the same. Okay, let me give you some examples. Um, we got about half an hour here, right? So I think I think I can get through this without rushing. Uh, comfortably show you the actual part you're interested in, which is doing things. Um, let's go back to a data set you already know uh, so that we can compare the results of sampling from the Markov chain versus the map estimates we got before. And I'm going to do this uh, next week as well. We're going to do comparisons. There are cases where they're the same. That is, the map, the quadratic approximation that map makes is okay sometimes, and sometimes it's not. So I want to show you uh, uh, when that is, and you can start to figure out um, cases where you really need to use the Markov chain. Uh, we're going to look at the terrain ruggedness data again because it's fresh in your mind, right? Uh, you're doing a homework problem with it. Yes? Seychelles? 
seashells, seashells, I can't say it, but uh, the Seychelles problem. And uh, we're going to re-estimate it using Stan just to see how things work and to give you some idea about how, to, how what a healthy and functioning markup chain should look like. Um, here's the map code again. Every, this is familiar, right? Uh, this is for predicting log GDP per capita in the year 2000 um, using the interaction between terrain ruggedness and the dummy variable for the, for the nation being in Africa. Um, essentially flat priors, very weakly regularizing to the, to the extent that there, there's basically no regularization here. Um, and, and these are the estimates we saw before. There's nothing new here. Okay, you with me? It's just to refresh your memories about what's going on. This uses the quadratic approximation. It finds the peak in the multivariate posterior, and then it finds the local curvature, uh, assumes the whole thing is parabolic, the log posterior is parabolic in every dimension all the way out, and defines a Gaussian distribution from that. Right? That's the quadratic approximation. That's what that table is at the bottom, right? minus the covariances. <laughs> Uh, HMC is not going to use any approximation, aside from the fact that it's manually just drawing samples from the thing. And uh, we can use the same formula list as in MAP. Um, but when you use STAN to, to keep it happy, you should pre-process all your variable transformations. So take the logs first, make a new variable that's log GDP. Don't put like log GDP. You can get away with this inside MAP sometimes, right, because it's really just executing our scripts. Uh, but with STAN, you can't. So when, inside of STAN, it doesn't have any access to the R interpreter anymore. So you need to pre-process pre all your transformations. And then trim the data frame just for your own sanity. You don't technically have to do this. Uh, but trim it down to only the variables you're using in this particular model uh, so that you're not pushing more data into it. Um, this is also healthy because it will suppress some warnings. Stan doesn't like character data. So if you've got categorical uh, text variables in your data set, Stan will throw these ugly, scary-looking warnings about something was ignored. Uh, and it's harmless, but it freaks people out. So I started just advising people to remove them from the data set so that you don't send me emails about it. Um, no, I'm happy to receive your emails about pointless warnings. They're easy. I just say, no, no ignore that. Uh, so that's all I've done here is pre-process that. Um, and uh, now the only thing that, that absolutely has to change in the code is map at the top becomes map to stand. Uh, but one thing uh, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce here, because it's a good place to do it, is instead of a uniform prior for sigma, which would work fine, uh, we're going to use a Cauchy uh, uh, distribution, a half Cauchy, actually, for sigma, uh, which is a weakly regularizing. <laughs> it's a regularizing prior for scale parameters like standard deviations. So let's take a quick minute before we um, uh, look at the output of that Markov chain to talk about who Cauchy is. This is Cauchy. Uh, Augustine, oui, Cauchy, and uh, like... Many French mathematicians, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and every place else, and uh, did some amazing math in, in his lifetime. He was actually, so he's, he's, his namesake is his distribution, among some other things, um, uh, which arises in, from all kinds of physical processes. Um, in physics, I think it's called the Lorentz distribution, uh, but Cauchy uh, analyzed it. Cauchy was one of the pioneers in proving that calculus worked and why. So calculus had been used for a long time, and no one actually could tell you why. Uh, then eventually, um, mathematicians said, that it's like, okay, we got this calculus thing. Maybe we need to figure out why it's justified. Uh, and they did that. He was one of the pioneers in that area. So some serious, important mathematics, actually. Um, the Cauchy distribution is the ratio of two Gaussian samples. That definition is unhelpful. Our interest in it is just because it's a weekly regularizing uh, prior distribution for scales when you use only the positive half of it. So we're going to use half Cauchy's and the positive half, um, there's a weak preference for small values and there's a really thick tail, which is what our interest in is in. So it's, it's effectively flat for a long time. That's why it's only weakly regularizing. But it's not perfectly flat. The important thing is infinity is impossible with a Cauchy distribution, uh, unlike a truly flat prior, and that's what you want. Cauchy's perform very well in regularization under simulation trials. Uh, uh, lots of people recommend it for that reason, so I want to introduce you to it here. Um, we're going to need it when we do multi-level models. We'll have to do some regularization on scale parameters. Uh, and this is related, those of you who study foraging or movement ecology, this is related to levy flights, uh, which are sampled from these thick tail distributions. Um, oh, I want to say, the mean and variance are undefined. If, you're, if you think this is a... This is a Probability distribution without a mean and without a variance. 
If that is intriguing to you, ask me afterwards, and I will explain it to you on the chalkboard. But I don't have time in the lecture, and some of you are like, yeah, I don't want to hear about that. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but there's a great and easy explanation for it, actually. But uh, afterwards, I can, t I can tell some people about it. Okay. When you run um, the map to stand code, very often you're going to get this message minus the keep calm part. <laughs> it should show that, actually. Uh, this is a very frightening message, but it's, almost near it's nearly always harmless. Um, and so what's going on here is there's some parameter which is bounded to be positive, and during warm-up, Stan has tried out a negative value of it, or a zero value for it. And then this informational message appears where it says it's rejecting something. The, the current Metropolis proposal, there's Metropolis again, uh, uh, is about to be rejected, which sounds harsh. <laughs> and, and then the scariest part is the last line. Uh, but if this warning occurs often, then your model may be either severely ill-conditioned or misspecified, right? Which sounds like the worst thing possible. Uh, so nearly always this is harmless, especially if it happens during the adaptation or warm-up phase. This is just stand feeling out the, the posterior distribution to find a good way to sample from it. There's no problem. If, it, if you get thousands of these filling up your screen, by all means, close R <laughs> and walk away. No. Um, <laughs> very slowly. No. Uh, Break the process and then look for the problem. Uh, chances are you've defined the model incorrectly. Uh, or email me, uh, whichever comes first. And uh, so, But that's the thing. It's nearly always harmless, so keep calm and carry on. But sometimes um, sometimes it's worth worrying about this. this is, again, this is one of the things I like about Stan is uh, when things are wrong, you get a good uh, indication of it. It's, it's overly cautious in its warning messages, which I like. I like it to be like that. Okay. Um, let me compare just the uh, marginal posterior distributions from the HME sample, HMC samples at the top from map to stan uh, and the quadratic approximation from map at the bottom. I want you to see that they're practically identical, right? Practically identical with N Monte Carlo error here. Uh, the, this posterior distribution is, is actually almost entirely multivariate Gaussian because the priors are Gaussian and the likelihood is Gaussian. So in theory, it should be Gaussian, and yes, it is. Uh, Marco Chain Monte Carlo didn't make any assumptions about it being Gaussian, though. It just turned out to be this way. So this might give you some confidence in the fact that, you know, math wasn't completely lying to you for all these weeks. Um, and that's often true. So classical statistics also makes these Gaussian assumptions, and often it's a perfectly fine assumption. Um, you get samples out of a map to stamp it model the same way you get, get them out of a map model by calling the same function. Although R is actually realizing it's mapped to stand and calling a different bit of code, but uh, it just pulls all the samples that were returned by the stand sampler. Um, and they're a list, uh, just like before. You get um, dollar sign and each parameter name. You access them as before. Uh, but the models can get more complicated, so we can have we can have matrix we can have parameters that are actually matrices, and we'll have some of those in a couple weeks uh, uh, in there as well. But you don't have to worry about that right now. Okay, the most important thing to do is check your chain. Sometimes the model doesn't work right. And so this is what the chain looks like for this model. This is a healthy chain. This is what you're looking for. This chain is both um, has low autocorrelation. That means it's exploring the space well. That means it's zigzagging a lot, right? It has good mixing. And you see by the, it looks kind of like a noise distribution, right? That means there's low correlation between the <coughs> subsequent steps. And that's what you want. That's what makes it efficient. Um, does that make sense? You're, Grace, your face looks like you were yes, unhappy with that. Sorry. I well, your head was in between okay. the drafts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my head is often a problem. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yes. And the other thing is it's stationary, meaning it's zigzagging around the same center of gravity as it moves along, right? So it, both of those things are what you want. If, if it were drifting in a direction, that would be bad. That would mean it was non-stationary. And if there was a really strong correlation between subsequent samples, like it was kind of tracing out a line, that would also be bad. That would mean it was inefficient. And you'll, you'll get this in your homeworks. It'll happen to you, and you'll see. I'll show you some examples, though. Uh, maybe, if not today, on the start of Thursday. I've just zoomed in here in the lower right to show you the first uh, 100 samples after the warm-up phase. This gray region is when it was adapting. So these aren't part of the posterior. This is just where Stan was figuring out the step size. I ran it much longer than was necessary. Let me show you. Um, so the gray region ends. We get real samples from the posterior, and we see it's moving around, right? It's zigzagging. So this is zoomed in. 
this is the monkey's car as it zooms around this high dimensional space. Um, and there are like five dimensions in this posterior distribution, I think. Um, uh, here they are, uh, the intercept in the upper left, and then the three regression parameters, and then sigma uh, down below. Uh, this is what you're looking for. This is a good chain. Uh, there, there are good chains that don't always look this nice, and they may still be fine. Uh, sometimes you do get autocorrelation between samples. That doesn't mean it's not working. It just means you need more samples. And we're going to look at some diagnostic criteria for that in, in a few slides. Um, you guys with me so far about these? Yeah. It seems sometimes like there is like some kind of sine curve going on in the, in the chains. Is that okay? Well, that's fine. I don't know. There's not there's not actually a sine. Well, well I know, but I mean, it looks like they're, they're there. I mean, there's a sense. It's interesting that you say a sine curve because uh, in a two dimensional uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulation, the path will tra trace out sin sinusoidal paths because that's how the physics works. And you'll actually get the deterministic path will trace out these sinusoidal paths in this, if you have a two-dimensional bucket and you spin a marble in it. You've probably done this at museums. There'll be the sinusoidal path that's traced out. And so not only is it not bad, but it means it's working right. Uh, so it's a great question that you, you have a good eye for trigonometry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's not exactly doing that here. But you notice they're responding to one another, right? When some of these parameters are sampled high, others are being sampled low. And that's, that's part because they're interdependent. Um, so uh, let's talk about warm-up for a second. Um, what is warm-up? Uh, warm-up is this adaptation phase. It's on these trace plots. So I should have said these are called trace plots. Um, they're just sequential samples plotted, plotted one after another. And uh, the gray region is, the, is those are not samples that are going to be returned to you by extract samples for use. They're automatically truncated out um, by map to stand. So you're not going to see them unless you really want them and then ask me how to get them. But, they're in there, but you don't need them. They're there for it to become an efficient sampler. Uh, it reduces the autocorrelation by tuning step size and such. Um, and something called the mass matrix, uh, which sounds sounds pretty awesome, right? Uh, it's a good band name, too. But uh, so uh, these things are not samples from the posterior. They're, they're a collection of experiments. Nevertheless, when mixing in the auto and uh, looks good and it's and it looks stationary in the warm-up phase, that's a good sign. Uh, but as I'll show you in a minute, um, a few minutes with a bad example, the, the warm-up phase can look great like it's mixing well, and then you start doing samples and it can all break. I'm going to show you an example of that later. Uh, so you want to look at the actual samples, not the warm-up to diagnose things. Um, and it's, oh, I want to say at the bottom, it's, this is not the same as burn-in on GIF sampling. GIF sampling to burn-in is from the posterior distribution. All the samples are. It's just the idea is you started way out of the target area, so you want to lop off the first part, the part where it crawled in to the, to the target area. You don't need to do that here because it's not the same thing. When Stan starts taking samples, it's in the target area already, automatically. It's always in the target zone uh, if, if everything's working right. So there's no burn-in with, with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, all right, some horoscopic advice on running these things. There's lots of superstition about Markov chains, uh, just like with everything else in statistics. Uh, to some extent, this is unavoidable because, you know, it's like there's ritual pollution and you have to cleanse yourself uh, of it. I want to give you what I think is some generally useful advice that is has a minimum of superstition in it. Uh, it's all right to be anxious about this, though, and ask questions about it. Um, uh, just keep in mind the goal. The goal is to get samples from the target distribution, and there are going to be lots of effective ways to do that. Uh, but there are things to look out for, and the horoscopic advice I'm about to give you are ways is a way to anticipate advice and notice it when it uh, uh, problems to anticipate problems and notice it uh, notice those problems when they happen. So the usual questions: How many samples do you need? Um, how many chains do you need to run? Because you don't, you can run as many as you like uh, within reason. And I want to give you some examples of uh, chains that aren't working quite right. Now, I'm definitely going to finish up that last part on Thursday because we've only got ten minutes here. So first thing to notice is when you use Precy on a map to stand fit, you get the usual four columns. Um, the difference being that now your, your interval points are highest posterior density and they're labeled lower and upper instead of the percentile intervals before. The reason is now there's no guarantee that these posterior distributions are symmetric. Uh, so you really don't want to use percentile intervals to describe their shape. You may not want to use these intervals either, uh, but at least these intervals are guaranteed to include the map. Uh, whereas the percentile intervals are not. So you may remember that from week one. Right? Uh, 
So that's the first difference. Uh, the next difference is you get these two diagnostic columns, which help you diagnose whether how well the chain is working. These are measures of its efficiency and its convergence. Um, NF is a measure of how well it's mixing, that is how, how low the correlations are between subsequent points. NF is the effective number of samples. It's a crude estimate that takes into account the correlation between subsequent pairs of points in the Markov chain. When they're highly correlated, we say there's high autocorrelation, and then the effective number of samples is low, because you're basically just staying on the same island over and over again. Uh, when there's a very low correlation or none between subsequent samples, then the effective number of samples is nearly the same as the actual number. That will happen sometimes with simple models, but usually it's lower because there's some correlation. Does that make sense? So NF is an idea uh, of, of how many samples you've actually got. You might think 300 is very is very little, but if it's multivariate Gaussian, that's all you need. Uh, I'll talk about this on the next slide, but that may be plenty, actually, for reasons I'll explain. R hat uh, diagnoses um, stationarity and mixing and uh, convergence to the target. Uh, lots of things. It, it really uses, um, works best when you use multiple chains, you run multiple chains, and you want them all to converge to the same stationary distribution. So you need multiple chains to confirm that. With one chain, you really can't tell. So uh, that's that's a reason to run more than one chain, at least when you're testing things. R hat converges to one from above when things are working. Uh, for both of these kinds of criteria, they are both known to fail. Uh, uh, that is, to give you false signals of security. Uh, so you, I encourage you to view them as alarms and not security blankets. When R hat is one, that doesn't necessarily mean it's working all right. Uh, just means it's consistent with it working all right. When R hat's much bigger than one, it's almost certainly broken. Uh, that said, even when it's much greater than one, it, it may just mean you haven't run the chain long enough. The chain may be fine. You just need to run it longer so that it converges to the stationary distribution. Um, uh, so don't get overconfident. Okay, how many samples do we need? When we talk about samples, focus on NF, the number of effective samples, not the actual number of samples you draw, because if they're highly autocorrelated, you're just getting redundant information over and over again. Um, you use these two optional parameters to map to stand called warm-up and, and iter for iterations to control the number of samples. Iter is the total number, including warm-up, you're going to draw, and warm-up is the length of the adaptation period. So when you're just getting started, and these are the defaults in map to stand, you're just seeing if it's going to compile and run. And all, this will be your biggest battle to begin with, because sometimes it won't, and you'll curse. Uh, so you want to do a short run at first and see if it looks insane. Uh, so run, run 2,000 samples, 1,000 of which are warm up. Get an idea if it's working. Uh, and that's fine. And that may be all you need, actually. Uh, for lots of cases, if, if the posterior distribution is multivariate Gaussian, 1,000 effective samples is a lot, because there's only... There's only the variance-covariance matrix and the vector means to estimate, right? There's only two moments that define the whole Gaussian distribution in one dimension, so you don't need a lot of information to do it. Um, eventually, uh, you'll want to do more. Uh, you check it works right. Um, uh, you may want to run more samples, so you increase either. Uh, you may want to run multiple chains so that you can check uh, R hat for convergence. Um, David, you have a question? Yeah, when you say samples, do you mean we're not taking every iteration after the one? I might have missed this. Are we not taking every iteration? It's like a thinning? thinning we're right? doing no thinning ever. Okay. Okay. You do not need the thin Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Thinning is a thing for those old engines like if sampling. So if, if there's really high autocorrelation, thinning loses no information. Typically the autocorrelation is going to be a lot lower with a Hamiltonian chain, a good one. So you don't need to do thinning. So yeah, these Gibbs sampling papers, you'll see that we ran the chain for 500,000 steps, right? And then we thinned every 50th sample. Uh, you will not be doing that kind of madness with this. And what's great about that is you need less hard drive space for your model and less memory. Uh, you can um, make stand thin, I think. I've never done it, but I think there's a thinning parameter in there. Uh, but you probably will never need to use it because of that. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, and we're not thinning. There, was there a hand over here? It was just auto grooming. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, it's like back in my head, I see auto room in the back of my head. Um, okay, let me justify really quickly the question of how many samples do you need. Uh, this depends upon your purpose. If you want to know where the posterior means are, you don't need very many samples at all. Why? Because you learned once upon a time, I think, if not, let me, let me teach you now, that the standard error of a, of a population mean is 1 over the square root of the sample size. So NF here is the sample size. So that goes down really fast. If you have 200 samples, you have a fantastically accurate estimate of the posterior mean. 
You really do. Uh, then the variance, it requires an order of magnitude more, but that's still not necessarily a lot. Uh, and so if things are multivariate Gaussian, you don't need a ton of samples. You don't need to hammer it to death. A thousand is actually, may give you a really good picture of what's going on. In any event, you can plot the density and get an idea uh, of how, how it works. If you're interested in the tails, the thin little tails of the posterior distribution, well, you're going to be an unhappy person for a long time because you're going to have to sample to death because this is the Gilligan's Island in, in uh, the Markov chain problem. It doesn't want to spend much time out there. Uh, so uh, that's, that's something that Markov chains are just not efficient for, is figuring out the shapes of the, the thin tails of probability distributions. Uh, luckily, we don't usually care about the one millionth percentile of something, right? Uh, if so, you need to get an analytical solution, I think. This is not a way to do it. That's my advice. Okay. And again, always focus on, on number of effective samples and not the actual number of samples. Um, the chains parameter controls how many independent chains you run. On the first run, I really encourage you to do only one chain, see if it compiles, see if it, if it looks like it's reasonably mixing. Um, then you want to do more than one chain to check convergence and check the R hat statistics. Uh, and four is a good, is a good uh, idea. Um, and four chains uh, started from different starting points would be even better. Right, because then they're starting from different initial values and you want to see them all approach the same region of parameter space. Um, and then when you do your final run, look, it's up to you. Uh, and this is where there's superstition. People will say, you got to run four chains and then like permute them or, look, uh, if any one of the chains is defined correctly and it's converging, any one chain is fine. If you've got multiple chains, that's great. If they've all converged, you can mix them together and that's fine too. It, it depends upon issues, which depend upon your exact setup, how many processors you have, and how comfortable you are in multiprocessing, whether you like RStudio, <laughs> because, because running multiple chains in RStudio may lead it to crash. Uh, because I've already told some of you, for multiprocessor stuff, you can't run it in a graphical interface on most of these systems. You've got to run it in the terminal. Uh, so, and then it works. Um, anyway, my heuristic usually, again, this is horoscopic advice, is one short chain to see if I've programmed it right, four medium ones to check convergence, and then I run two really long uh, ones from different starting positions, and uh, then use those samples um, to make inferences from it. But, you know, in, in particular cases, for simple models in this class, the one short run at the start is often plenty. But I encourage you to play around while you're getting used to this and try. Uh, your computer will never explode uh, from running my code, I promise. And uh, uh, so you're not going to break anything. And you want to play around and actually try to break stuff, because that's how you figure out the operating limits uh, of these things. Um, OK, got a couple minutes here. Uh, I think I should probably stop right here. Uh, uh, why don't we stop right here? Uh, when you guys come back on Thursday, we're going to pick up with an example of a wild Markov chain, a chain that's been defined badly. So you can see what a bad chain looks like. And then I'll show you how to fix the bad chain, train it. Uh, and I'll show you a couple examples of that, and then we'll do some maximum entropy. All right, I'll see you on Thursday.